Fourteen people are dead. A Delta Airlines passenger plane crashed immediately after takeoff. The aircraft impacted the ground after failing to properly climb into the air. When it crashed, it erupted into flames. Investigators would discover that a misconfiguration of the aircraft during the takeoff preparations was at play in the disaster. We've looked at other accidents that sort of fall into that category of plane crash. Where this accident differs from others is the additional human element in the disaster, and we even have a cockpit voice recording to go over. Whereas most of our videos take place in the air, today we stay mostly on the ground and examine where things went wrong. Dallas-Fort Worth Airport is one of the largest and busiest airports in the entire world. The airport is one of the major hubs for American Airlines. Delta Airlines doesn't really have a large base here. Delta Flight 1141 was the return trip from Jackson, Mississippi to Salt Lake City. The flight makes an intermediate stopover in Dallas. The aircraft arrived in Dallas at 7.38 local time that Wednesday morning the first leg having went off uneventfully. The plane itself was a Boeing 727-200, a narrow-body trijet aircraft that has nearly all but disappeared from the skies today. First taking to the skies in the mid-1960s, the 727 was as popular as ever in the 1980s. The planes were everywhere in the United States. All the major air carriers in the country flew the type, as it was pretty much the perfect plane at the time to fly those medium-range routes that connect the major cities. 48-year-old Captain Larry Davis was the commander of Flight 1141 that day. He had been a pilot with Delta since 1965 and had extensive experience flying the DC-9 where he first became a captain. In 1979, he switched to the 727 and, until the time of the accident, that was the only plane he flew. The previous month, he had received further routine training on the aircraft. The younger first officer, 36-year-old Kerry Kirkland, joined Delta at the age of 27 and had been flying the 727 for two years. The third member of the crew was the flight engineer, or second officer as the accident report calls him, 30-year-old Stephen Judd. As the youngest member of the flight crew, he only first took to the skies in the 727 earlier that year. Once the turnaround was complete in Dallas, a total of 108 people were on board the plane, 101 passengers, 3 pilots, and 4 flight attendants. As we'll soon uncover, one of the stewardesses would come to play an intriguing role in what transpired in the following minutes. 8.30 in the morning. Delta Flight 1141 was pushed back from the gate and was given taxi instructions to taxi to runway 18 left. Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, even in 1988, had a total of six runaways. They do everything bigger in Texas, after all. Runway 18 left, 36 right, was, and still is, this runway highlighted here. The 727 began taxiing but was stuck behind numerous other planes. An American Airlines DC-10 was positioned directly in front of Flight 1141. The 727 was stuck in traffic, effectively. To save on fuel, the number 3 engine was temporarily shut down. That was the rightmost engine. It was in the following minutes that a flight attendant approached the flight deck and the flight crew and cabin crew member started conversation about various topics, descending into casual social banter. We do have some of the cockpit voice recording, but this recording was a bit controversial. The National Transportation Safety Board is usually prevented from releasing such content to the media. However, the CVR in this case found its way to television, and this rather interesting conversation was recorded. Talking about 
The voice of the flight attendant was later identified as belonging to 56-year-old Dixie Dunn. She had been a flight attendant for Delta for 33 years. The accident report's transcript of cockpit conversations listed this conversation under quote, non-pertinent conversations between the flight crew and a flight attendant. It is reported that other topics of conversation included drinks, birds, and the upcoming presidential election of 1988. Eventually, air traffic controllers found a gap in the congestion, and Flight 1141 was given an instruction to taxi onto the runway and hold position. This caught the pilots off guard. It was something they weren't expecting, but was a welcomed change of plan. What happened next was that the pilots found themselves overwhelmed with configuring the plane for takeoff. Not only were there checklists that needed to be performed, but the number three engine also needed to be restarted. It is believed that the pilots were not only distracted with their conversations, but also rushed the next few moments in order to make for a departure. They even needed to request an additional minute's holding time to prepare the plane. The flaps, as you probably noticed in the recording, were clearly called out. Evidently, though, the pilots failed to adequately perform the checklist, as investigators would later discover the flaps were in the retracted position when the plane crashed. Even though they thought the flaps were extended to 15 degrees, they weren't. They were in the retracted position and no one noticed. It was assumed the flaps were already out. Flaps on a large passenger plane like this are essential for the takeoff. They make the wing physically bigger so that the wing generates substantially more lift. The pilots would have calculated a set of speeds with the flap configuration of 15 degrees taken into account. Flight 1141 continued the takeoff preparations with the aircraft lined up on the runway. Takeoff clearance was given and Captain Larry Davis pushed the throttle control forward. Accelerating down the runaway, all three members of the flight crew were oblivious to the fact that their aircraft's flaps were not extended. As Flight 1141 approached takeoff speed, the pilots would have expected that they would have been able to pull the plane up into the sky with ease, as they would have done countless times before. So imagine how they must have felt when the control wheel was pulled back and the plane did not fly. Listening into the final moments of the cockpit voice recording here, which we'll now play through till the end, their initial thoughts jumped to engine failure. Interestingly, though the pilots correctly noticed a decrease in engine performance, the engines were experiencing compressor stalls, this was due to lack of airflow intake into the engines, not due to engine failure directly. The Boeing 727 barely left the ground. Captain Davis continued to raise the nose of the plane, even after the stick shaker stall warning was activated. Without the sufficient lift to achieve a steady climb, the plane rolled to the right. The right wing struck the localizer equipment at the end of the runway, setting that wing on fire. It impacted the ground, broke apart, and skidded to a halt engulfed in flames. Despite the horrifying nature of the crash, 94 people walked away from the plane and survived. However, 
13 people perished initially. Among the dead was flight attendant Dixie Dunn, who just moments previously was casually chatting to the flight crew, of which all three pilots survived. One man who reportedly survived the crash and exited the burning plane attempted to re-enter the aircraft to rescue his wife. He died from severe burns 11 days later, bringing the death toll to 14. When investigators first arrived on the scene, it was established that for some reason the plane couldn't climb, and there were a number of possible explanations going in. Everything from an overweight plane to engine failure to wake turbulence from another aircraft. These were all ruled out following the discovery of the aircraft's flap configuration. The flaps clearly were not extended. Investigators determined that a combination of distractions and a rushed preparation for takeoff meant that the pilots overlooked the key configuration of the plane and attempted the takeoff without the flaps extended. In this video, we will not lay blame or point fingers at any one individual. We'll leave that up to yourself as a viewer to come to your own conclusion based on this information. The thing is, it may be easy at the end of the day saying that as a pilot and commander, the responsibility for the safe operation of a plane lies with the flight crew, and this may be a perfectly valid takeaway. However, before you make your conclusion, there is something that you didn't hear on the cockpit voice recording. The takeoff configuration warning. It's a loud audible alert in the cockpit that sounds when a pilot attempts takeoff when their plane is not properly configured, whether that be flaps or something else like stabilizer trim. It is triggered once the throttle is pushed past a certain point tripping a switch, activating the alarm. It's designed to immediately draw the pilot's attention, and it sounds something like this. The takeoff configuration warning exists for the very scenario that occurred that day in 1988. It's a failsafe measure that's not there to do the pilot's job, but rather to, in those rare times, step in and say, hey, you forgot to do this. Clearly, as you yourself heard on the recording, it didn't go off. If it had, the pilots would have seen that the flaps were not extended and the takeoff would have been aborted. The question now being, why? Why didn't it sound? Well, as it turned out, this particular plane had a defect in this warning system that was never fixed. The problem had been noted, but when the plane went in for its last maintenance check, workers didn't fix it. The failure itself, according to the accident report, was found to be, and quote, likely due to contamination or misalignment of the takeoff warning system throttle switch. With all of that said though, considerable criticism was drawn towards Delta and the Federal Aviation Administration for failing to adequately implement the necessary training for efficient cockpit management, not to mention the fact that the pilot flying went against Delta and Boeing's operational procedures and basic flying science by increasing the angle of attack when the plane clearly couldn't climb. This lack of training at Delta was picked up on, but the FAA failed to hold the airline to account. A certain philosophy at Delta had also emerged, in that it's believed that the poor discipline and performance on the flight deck that day may have been induced further due to Delta's encouragement of, quote, maximum captain discretion, as the accident report puts it. The three flight crew members were fired from their jobs at Delta. Flight engineer Stephen Judd, however, was reportedly reinstated. As for Captain Larry Davis and First Officer Kerry Kirkland, they never flew commercially again. Hello everyone, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it or found it to be interesting, be sure to be subscribed as there is always a new video every Saturday. I am happy to say that we are currently on track to be releasing an additional extra disaster breakdown video mid-January. I'm aiming for the 17th, so be subscribed so you can catch that. We also have a new microphone. I'm hoping that the narration was a bit crisper in this video. This was the first video to use the new equipment, so let me know what you think. Still getting used to it, but I think I've now figured it out with all the settings and all that stuff. 
Anyway, I would like to take a moment to thank my amazing patrons for their ongoing support. Their contributions have really helped the channel over these past two years. A massive thanks to them. Their names are scrolling on the screen right now. If you yourself would like to support the channel further, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from just £1 per month, and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below, along with my personal Twitter page. All patrons get early access to all new content two days before it goes up publicly on YouTube. I'll not keep this outro long. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day, a good weekend, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.